I don't know if we can watch this because I feel like this is going to have blood in it. No. It was all there in front of your face, you know. Welcome to reality. The man you're looking at is 24 year old YouTuber Randy Stare. He's obsessed with two things not often found together, the cartoon Danny Phantom and Columbine. Although this should have raised red flags what? when Randy's descent into madness went overlooked by those around him, nothing would stand in his way from becoming a mass killer. What's up Ewoo crew, it's the Raven, here to share another shocking, interesting, or just strange but very true story with you. Today's subject is Randy Stare, more popularly remembered as Andrew Blaze. Despite being known by his YouTube pseudonym, I'm going to use his legal name Randy when talking about him, as this is the name that would eventually become infamous. What makes this case uniquely disturbing is the fact that Randy actually videotaped everything up until the day of his massacre and left behind a trail of disturbing clues in preparation for his final plan. And although all the signs were there that something was about to go very wrong, Randy's fans either ignored it or didn't take it seriously. But Randy was dead serious, and I'm not exaggerating when I say the motive behind his massacre is the most bizarre I've ever heard. Randy first became interested in YouTube in 2008, eventually creating a channel called Pioneer Productions. At first, his content seemed pretty normal. He created Let's Plays, filming himself and his reactions as he played video games. And sometimes he'd act out skits with a toy frog and stuffed whale. He rubbed shoulders with some popular creators in YouTube's early days. He was mentioned at one point in a Ray William Johnson video, bragged that Fred supposedly liked one of his videos, and was even friends with Plasma Master Don, a YouTuber who recently died and was then allegedly exposed as a sex offender. But as Randy's videos fuck? went on, there was a noticeable change. You see, Randy was obsessed with the Nickelodeon cartoon Danny Phantom which follows the adventures of main character Danny Fenton, who became a human-ghost hybrid after an accident involving the portal between the human world and the ghost zone. This is where Randy first saw the character Ember McLean. She was his first crush, and the moment he laid eyes upon her in his late elementary years, he said he instantly felt something change within him. Like, if you look on the poster behind me, those were inspired by Ember McLean, which is a ghost from a TV show called Danny Phantom, which started back in 2000. It's in the background that it's, like, censored from the show sex toys rule 34 you can't just blast rule 34 dude are you kidding me no shot i don't think that he's blasting rule 34 in the background dude it's probably to not get copy striked uh, by nickelodeon or something nickelodeon copyright right yeah i can see that three 2004 you know, I was in late elementary school at that time. But this ghost, this woman always connected with me. But ever since I first saw her, something changed. And it wasn't like I grew up or anything like that. Like I realized, oh my gosh, I'm attracted to girls and all this. No, it just, something changed. It was like a spark. And it just connected with me, it made me feel warm inside. And it felt very familiar, which was strange. It was like I'd seen her before. That was just, that was it. From that point forward, she never left my life again, ever. He became convinced that after he died, he would return to his true form, a ghost girl just like Ember, and that he'd live on with the fictional characters he'd created in Ember's Ghost Squad, or EGS. This was what Randy called his big realization, that he didn't belong here on Earth, he was actually a ghost girl, and the only way he could return to what he was truly supposed to be was by dying. During this time, he also began struggling with his gender identity, leading him to experiment with wearing bras. I guess... What it came down to was I felt like I was like transgender or something. Like I felt like a, a woman the whole time, which spiritually I'm a woman. I'm a female soul, but I had to live in a man's body. Holy shit. This person was just like, this person was trans. And like probably had a fuckload of internalized like transphobia and, and so many other uh so many other issues on top of that right that's crazy when was this video made this video is new holy fuck i mean listen you can be trans not realize it and then also simultaneously have murderous uh, fucking urges and be crazy separately 
It has nothing to do with like being trans in general. He did what he did in 2017. She did what she did. Or actually, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they would want to be uh, gendered as male or female. I, I don't know. It's kind of weird that they don't like fucking mention it. It's kind of weird that they don't mention it uh, in the beginning of the video. It, it is wild. He said it was a ghost girl, not a woman. He literally identifies a cartoon girl from Danny Phantom. Who cares the murder? I mean, it, I, it doesn't matter. You're not supposed to fucking... Just because someone's a piece of shit that doesn't mean you misgender them and uh, or, or, or fucking psycho. Like, I, it's entirely separate. But when you see like a black person do a murder, do you call them the N-word? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, it doesn't give you an excuse to, to just be like a bigoted person, dude. Like, you can't do that. He said he had a female soul. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's a unique case. They, they might not have been. Seems like they stopped identifying as female. Keep watching. I don't know what pronouns either are. Says my favorite trans chatter, young Zoe. Every year of my life since 2013, I just felt more and more feminine. Can't even explain it. Look at, look at the bathroom. Look at where my stuff was. You'll see there's a girl's Venus razor there. There's the skin to mitt stuff that girls use to shave their legs and arms with. Every three days since like 2016, I've been shaving my arms and legs and entire body every three days. It's just one thing I'll say is like that white stain on the floor, like that splotch you'll see on my carpet. That was an ember thing. I just, I wanted to make my skin as white as possible to look like her. I wanted it to be completely white, so I bought this, this body paint, which was like, I don't even know what it was. It was like latex that like, it becomes like glued to your skin and you gotta peel it off. And it got on the carpet and then it got freaking in my body hair, which like almost never came out at the time what little body hair I had at the time anyways, but, um, that stuff never came off. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, you're over there sleeping, and here I am at 3 in the morning covering myself in this latex. Randy's inner turmoil was far from over, and although his passion for Ember would continue to intensify, it wasn't long before he was forming a new obsession, the Columbine High School Massacre. He began frequently posting on a Columbine forum and participating in different threads, even a thread for sharing Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold memes. One post that caught his attention read, I know the students finished the 1999 school year at a nearby school, but I was wondering if they still had to complete their final exams. What about exams for the injured? It'd be so mean to make Patrick take them after he got out of the hospital. Randy replied, I never thought about that, ha ha ha. Tests had to be the last thing on the surviving victims' minds. To me, Randy just seemed like one of those people who, when he's interested in something, he dives in headfirst with an almost uncanny hyperfixation. But unfortunately, none of his obsessions were healthy. Yeah, I mean, listen. Listen, I think that this person probably has a lot. I mean, not probably. Clearly has a lot of, of issues. But it almost feels like it almost feels like mental health and a support system could have literally prevented whatever murder that they engage in. I have no idea. In a lot of instances, that is usually the case. Like, but... Sometimes we watch uh, murderers and we're like, dude, what the fuck? Like, like yesterday, the guy from yesterday who was just like deeply addicted to uh, uh, e-girls, right? Like that dude had a support system, right? That dude had people that were like there to help him, tried to reach out, tried to help him, try to change his behavior, try to see him. Uh, and, 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 and he still was like, nah, fuck that. I'm literally going to murder all of you. This person, on the other hand, I feel like does not have that same kind of uh, support system. It doesn't feel like they do. Uh, and also on top of that, like, like, it's obvious that they were like looking for attention and recognition from their family that they might be trans. They bring it up multiple times. You know what I mean? Like, it's clear. It doesn't justify the murder. Don't get me wrong. It's just that like, it's so sad when... It, some of these instances like where you you can see how the other person could have been other person is like a victim of their own circumstances as well he purchased two shotguns writing in his journal you were a fool to trust me with that shotgun oh mother if only you realize you just signed my death warrant by taking me to that gun shop that just happened that just fucking happened oh my goddess oh my goddess i am f armed i am f armed I got it! I 
got it. Two Mossberg 500 shotguns. My boss has been trying to get on day shift or second shift. He had an opportunity to get it but the way things are looking, he's not gonna get it. So then also put me like on the clock here because it's like he's been trying to look for other places to work. The way I see it, I can just barely have enough time to do all this within four weeks. I want it to be the night of June 9th. I can't tell my parents that I have two shotguns now. They know I have the one, but then if they see that I have the exact same gun, but two inches shorter on the barrel, it'd be like, why do you need that? And that's when it starts to get into like personal stuff. Like, why do you need two shotguns? You're scaring me. Please don't start buying more guns, you know. I have all the pieces. I'm just waiting on getting some eyeliner. So far, it's been okay. I've gotten the occasion of like, why are you obsessed with this Columbine? But other than that, virtually nothing. I don't think people would actually like, think I would actually consider doing something like this. He took target practice videos and what appeared to be in his backyard with someone else holding the camera and filming him. It makes you wonder who exactly was filming him and how they couldn't have realized something was about to go very wrong. Especially- That's the South, dude. That's America, baby. That's what it is. Why would they? Why would they uh, think that like someone who's uh, glorifying school shooters would be shooting a sawed-off shotgun and that would be a cause for concern? That's just the most, that's the most, uh, that's the least violent American out there. Taking Randy's shirt into consideration. What, natural selection? Never mind. That's not even, oh God, I thought it was like, I thought the shirt was even worse. I thought the shirt said like, I'm going to do a school shooting or something. It just says natural selection. Like, literally every hog is just like, PA equals South? Hello? Hello? Do you know the state of Pennsylvania, motherfucker? You're going to act like the Pennsylvania is not like entirely, almost entirely a Southern state in attitude? Okay? He's literally in rural Pennsylvania. It is one of the more, Pennsylvania is more South than Miami. That's the same shirt one of the Columbine shooters wore? Okay, there you go. The same shirt Eric Harris wore on the day of the Columbine massacre. Should I hit the button? What That's happened mom. next is almost unbelievable. Randy began deliberately leaving a disturbing trail of notes and tweets that he was planning something, and the date for his plan was June 7th. He was not being very subtle at all, but still nobody seemed to even care. In his journal, Randy seemed almost disappointed that his parents didn't notice he was planning something. He wore his natural selection shirt time and time again and was shocked that his parents didn't catch the reference. But Eric Harris had a white t-shirt, black text, natural selection. I bought three of them, yet none of you knew what it meant, which blew my mind. I didn't want to tell you that, so I kept that under wraps. That's a warning sign. He wrote, how she hasn't questioned me or seen the signs is beyond me. Looking back now, you might realize, geez, I, I don't know how I missed it. You might just start having flashbacks in your head of certain things, like certain situations where it's like, wow, that was one of them, or that was a warning sign right there. Or, he wondered in his journal if he would have fangirls who would obsess over him. That'd be great, he wrote. He began tweeting a series of alarming messages, not only on his main Twitter account, but on the variety of alternate Twitter accounts he had created to roleplay or pretend to be his characters. You know, I wrote all this dark, brutal, morbid, grim stuff into my videos and people ate it up and they loved it. They didn't realize that I actually meant it all. I started posting on all my social media how I really felt. Amber was always there in this dark place like I mentioned. She fueled me to do this. I was like she told me to do this. Do it for the Ghost Squad. You know, we need more souls. He even convinced himself that one of his own fictional characters he had created, Mackenzie, was his soulmate. He drew himself as a ghost girl with Mackenzie holding hands. Captioned, love this girl. Posing as these characters on multiple Twitter accounts, he took on their personalities and pretended he was all of them tweeting at each other, but really just at himself. Before Randy's big plan, the Ember Ghost Squad Twitter account tweeted, If you think your body is ready for June 7th, then you're gravely mistaken. 17 days is your calendar marked. Hashtag big things. Hashtag June 7th. As the days counted down to his plan, he posted under his McKenzie account, I can't take my eyes off the countdown clock. Andrew isn't crazy, just caught in the middle of two worlds and dimensions. People don't see or understand that. Looking back on these Twitter accounts. Vibe check is, is uh, there's no vibe check here. This is like all broken. I mean, I mean, vibe check number one. They're a YouTuber. That's it. 
that's the automatic L. That's the automatic vibe check failure. It would have been worse if they were streaming on Twitch, but like, you know. Makes sense. Feels weird as you're looking in on Randy's. Yes, as a self report, I'm making a joke. Alter egos. Randy made his character Mackenzie calm and shy, while he made his other character Rachel violent and angry. In speaking through his characters, he would tweet back and forth about his plans in the wide open for everyone to see. The only thing I can think is maybe people assume the edgy and haunting content of the posts was Randy's way of really getting into the or ghost. Or maybe nobody saw it because these are like random ass fucking accounts. Look at this. They're just talking to themselves on the internet, dude. Themed characters. But to him, the fun and games, the pretending, had ended a long time ago. What might be most notable about his accounts is his character Rachel's clear obsession with Columbine. Clearly, his two worlds were now inextricably intertwined. At this point, Randy was completely lost in his fictional world and convinced that he would die and come back as one of his characters. It was his own fantasy that would spell his doom. And as his social media antics continued and time slowly ran out, it should have been obvious to anyone following his Twitter accounts that something was very wrong. Here's where things get chilling. Randy wanted to go out with a bang, and in a sickening twist, he decided it would all come down to a coin flip. Whether he would commit a massacre at home or at the supermarket where he worked the night shift. And this is what happened. Okay, so here's the deal. Oh my god. Got a 1983 quarter right here. You believe in fate? Here's the fate test. I'm gonna flip this three times, or the best out of three, rather. And if it's heads, I'll do it here. If it's tails, supermarket. Best of three. Here we go. It is no country for old men. They got the same hair too as uh, Anthony Chagrin. I'm not gonna touch it. You will see it as I see it. If I can find it, there it is. That's the tails. See that? Looking at it. You land, you son of Anthony Chagrin, whatever, shut up. I've never said a name right. Heads. <laughs> Had to be, huh? Have to have it come down to the very last coin flip. Okay, this is it. For all the marbles. Except we're playing for much more than marbles here. I can't believe I'm having this come down to a coin flip. They say marbles? The flip of a coin. Here it goes. With a lot of killers like this, there's something weirdly um, liberating for them about like having control over this. It's very narcissistic that they, it's like a God complex thing where they're like, I have other people's lives and fates in my hand. And you can tell that they're enjoying the fact that a coin flip is going to decide who gets to be murdered in this situation. You fell off plus L, Shapiro did it better, plus Jank made you, plus on pause or all on sub. One, two, three. It's gonna land behind the camera, just to the side. I can't see it. I see it in the grass, but I can't see it. Tails. I forgot that which one that meant. It is a tails, folks. Tails. They're not a very good storyteller. Like, they should be reinforcing wh which one that means. Which means there's going to be a loss of a human life besides my own. Possibly more than one. 
That's fate for you. And just like that, it was decided, with something as silly and trivial as the flip of a coin, the fates of innocent people were sealed, and they had no idea about any of it. Ready to die. Ready to go. Six more nights, it'll all be over. You hear that? That's how quiet it's gonna be in my house for a week. I wanna know how everyone's gonna take this. How much they're gonna cry. How long are they gonna cry for? For all I know, this story could just be headlines one day around here and then be gone. And not become anything for all I know. He kind of talks to the camera, he goes, Twitch rumor, we should really check out Twitch rumors more often. Oh, oh. Don't worry. That would mean that Twitch rumors have to go outside. So. Oh. On June 1st, 2017, Randy posted that he was going to need the help of his fans the next Wednesday night. Randy said he needed someone to record a brief live stream of him. I decided to broadcast it live on Facebook. I know something's going to end the stream. It's going to get cut short, I get reported, flagged, whatever. In his next message on June 2nd, Randy talks about the Westboro High Massacre video he made, which he promised would come out on June 7th. What happened? What the f happened, man? This is surreal right now, but I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think this is gonna be my last video. I don't know what will happen to my channels after this. I don't know what people are gonna think of me after this. It doesn't bother me, but just looking at everyone at the supermarket, the manager's coming in, ah, da, 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 just messing around and talking about this, and four more nights, your whole lives are gonna be turned upside down because of me. I'm gonna f your life up. I can't wait. I want that supermarket to be closed for like a f month or go out of business. It's a crime scene. <laughs> it's gonna be a crime scene and then i mean i think the ultimate self-report always is manifesto you write a manifesto it's like automatically you're you should be put on a watch list okay and no i don't mean the communist manifesto it'll be over and then everything will just be thrown away whoever would have thought that a cartoon character would cause this to happen. A cartoon character. How can a cartoon character bring all this out in you? How is that even possible? The biggest question will always be why. I only partially told you why. I'm not gonna tell you everything. And there's stuff that you still don't know about me that I'll never tell you. I'll take it to the grave. Em, you want a chip? <laughs> I'm not a psychopath. I don't hunt people down and kill them. I need to eat something substantial. Why does Jack, with absolute certainty, say that? They are not schizophrenic at all when they're talking to a fake personality that isn't there. Like they're just, they're talking to M. <clears throat> no. Because that's not how schizophrenia works. Read the DSM. Disassociative identity disorder doesn't work like that. Isn't that. Or having like a, because you can't diagnose someone by watching a video, Hassan, LMAO. Okay, well, I'm speculating and I don't know anything about psychology, okay? I'm dying here. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Take away YouTube, I'm nothing. I mean, there's other dimensions out there besides Earth. There's going to be a big eternal war. I will be laughing my white ghost female ass off. When I get messages saying, you know, I help people get through dark times, or I change their life, you know, or my videos make them laugh their ass off or put a smile on their face, you know, that's, that's all I ever really wanted deep down. I just, it wasn't there in the beginning. Like in the beginning, I just wanted to be like, I wanted to get famous from it. That was pretty much it. But I was like Onision that had an actual decent fan base pretty much. Personally, I actually used to watch Onision back in two. Oh my God. Mega self-report. 2009. <laughs> I used to use his music in my videos, and I just sort of went like, "All right, he's making really weird that I don't care about." So, because he would cross dress and, and I'm like, uh, "No thanks." Even though I cross dress myself, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I'm pretty similar with some things we view. <laughs> I say really brutal shit on Twitter sometimes, but people support it sometimes. It blows my mind. It's like cool. It's a man's world. Men, women are better. <laughs> I'm gonna miss you guys. I really am. My emotions just aren't what they used to be. Yet the most random thing in the world. <laughs> most normal Onision fan. Stop. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild that like someone who is a psychopathic murderer is like, fuck man, Onision, kind of cringe. Yeah, I know I'm about to do a murder in, in four days, but uh, at Onision, very cringe. What can make me cry, but things that are supposed to make you cry, they don't. Let It Go and Frozen made me cry. A lot. 
Not just once, numerous of times. Like almost every time I'd watch the Why movie. Why are they watch, so mad about this? It's the movie like 20 times. Life's real short. Sometimes it feels like an eternity, but life's so damn short. And look at me, I, it's like I blinked and I was 24 and a half. And I'll die 24 and a half. I sit here and I ask myself, would I do it all over again if I could? I'm gonna be dead before next week ends. I'll be dead, legit dead. This is it. So okay, I'll miss you guys. I'll miss you a lot. Some of you, maybe I'll see on the other side. And this is Andrew Blaze signing off for the last time. Enjoy the rest of your lives. Andrew, out. And then... Dude, don't tell me they filmed it, like, the entire thing. Are you fucking kidding me? Okay, 2950, let me just cloak. <clears throat> okay, they don't show anything. That's crazy. They're, like, literally showing the fucking narrator, or the... They're showing, like, footage, but they're not showing anything. He didn't film it. There's a lot of other weird shit in here, though. He took a strange and eerie video of the Wise Market grocery store, the place he worked for seven years, and the same place that would later become a crime scene. In this video, it seems he's scoping around the store and checking all the exits. I'm looking for blood, chat, chill. And it's incredibly haunting to watch, knowing what would happen just one day later. On the night of June 7th, just hours before the horror that was about to unfold, Randy posted his final video to YouTube his big animation project. It starts out and shows him loading two shotguns, which he calls the twins, named Mackenzie and Rachel after his favorite fictional characters, before he stuffs them into a duffel bag. I gave them names. The first one I bought, I called Rachel, and then I called the smaller one Mackenzie, after Mackenzie West. As much as you might find it hard to believe, in this poster, I'm the one wrapping my arms around her. That's me. Again, this is a reference to Columbine, as Eric Harris also named his firearm. But Randy didn't stop there. Eric had etched the name into the firearm, and Randy decided to do the exact same thing. Now I duct taped the pistol grip thanks to Eric Harris. It's in this video that he proclaims, I've been stepped on my whole life, not anymore. I've had enough of this putrid planet, and I'm going to leave my mark. Yeah, kind of dark. And it honestly makes me wonder what was a bigger motivator for him in the end. The rebirth as a ghost girl he so desperately wished for, or simply getting the attention he desired for so long. You're looking at the beginning of his video right now, hours before what happened. At this point, Randy isn't being discreet. In fact, he practically bragged that something was going to happen. It was in plain sight now, and there was still time to stop him, but still no one reported a thing. I started talking with a girl online. And I started talking to her about the shotgun I got. She was one of only two people I told about the shotgun. Clearly, something dark is about to happen, but I have to warn you that what happens next is extremely disturbing. Especially because this is the kind of thing that seems like it could happen anywhere and to anyone. The next day, in the early morning hours of June 8th, 24-year-old Randy was working his night shift at the store. He and four other employees of the store were stocking the shelves while they got ready to close. It was well after midnight, and the store was quiet as they were all pretty tired. But because they all wanted to get the work done and head home, none of the other employees noticed that Randy wasn't actually doing his job. Instead of helping close the store and stock shelves, he was creeping to each of the exits and barricading them with pallets, trapping everyone inside. This calm and calculated preparation is especially chilling to me because there were so many chances to second guess the plan and turn back before it was too late. Randy took none of them. He casually walks to the emergency exit and pushes a pallet in front of the door before he goes back to cleaning up the store. When he pauses again, none of his co-workers think anything of it, especially because Randy is on his phone. What no one knew was that Randy was sending out a few different videos and posts which were all detailed plans of the disturbing thing he was going to do next. On one of his Twitter accounts, he uploaded videos called Journal, Digital Set, and most concerningly, one called Suicide Tapes. At 10 p.m., he tweeted as Mackenzie, I hope we were able to get you through the day. I always... Bro, I've never seen Danny Phantom. Like, I, I didn't even know this was a thing. It looks like Fairly Odd Parents. I thought it was like an offshoot of like Fairly Odd Parents or God Parents. Is that what the fucking... Don't, it will fuck you up, man. Wait, what? Really? It's made by the Fairly Odd Parents. It's a risky watch. Why? If you look at the Ember music video, every comment is about this dude. Please say goodbyes, but it's more like, see you later. Thank you, Mackenzie. Just before 1 a.m., right before the massacre, he tweeted as Rachel, Me and Andrew are going to give the world a little insight as to what really lurks around in the shadows of your everyday lives. 
As soon as he was sure that the videos and tweets were up, Randy begins his sinister plan, something that everyone on the internet can now see coming. But his unsuspecting co-workers have no idea that they're trapped in a nightmare that Randy has already made sure they can't escape. Around 1 a.m. with the doors at the back of the building all blocked, Randy marches his way to the main entrance to the store, where he locks the doors and blocks them with another pallet. Then he pulls out the two pistol grip pump action shotguns he had hidden in the duffel bag that he brought to work. Randy had brought two guns just in case one of them breaks down on him or jams and he has no way of fixing it. As you'll see, Randy has taken great care to ensure that everything will go according to his gruesome plan. Eerily calm, Randy walks through the store, shotguns ready. The details of what happens next are debated, as the news accounts differ from what one of the employees says happened. I'll tell you all of it so you can make up your own mind. All the replies to the tweets are like the mad lad actually did it and shit, by the way. Yeah, that's like 2017 internet. Where every fucking psycho on 4chan fetishized and also celebrated like death and destruction. That's how horrible people's lives are. That's crazy, man. You gotta be a real fucking freak to be like, oh, it's so sick that it's happening. You know what I mean? Just like the people who protest the ad breaks at the top of the hour. But be warned, what happens next is terrifying. In the store with Randy are 25-year-old Victoria, 47-year-old Brian, 63-year-old Terry, and 25-year-old Kristen. According to Kristen, she was in the same aisle as Victoria, working together to restock the shelves. Both girls have their headphones in, with Victoria's music cranked up and Kristen's a little lower. The two are goofing around when Victoria goes further down the aisle to get another stack of labels, completely unaware of what was about to happen. I don't hate Victoria, but you gotta go, Randy had written earlier in his journal. All of a sudden, from where she is standing, Kristen hears a few popping sounds, followed by a thud. Kristen doesn't know it, but Randy has just shot Victoria, first wounding her across the chest. But as she turned to run from him, he kept pulling the trigger, shooting her from behind at the base of her skull. Oh and then God. Kristen's whole world turns upside down. When she turns to see what the popping noise was, she's met with Randy standing at the end of the aisle, about several feet away from her, the guns in his hands and Victoria laying on the ground between them. As she watches in horror and shock, Randy mercilessly fires a few more shots into Victoria. Then Randy looks up and he and Kristen lock eyes as they stare at each other. Her feet are rooted to the ground, her mind racing a mile a minute, trying to comprehend what is happening. After a few heart-pounding seconds, during which Randy must have been debating killing her, he just turns and walks into the other aisle. Now this is one of the places that accounts differ, as Kristen says that she made eye contact with Randy after he shot Victoria, which is incredibly disturbing to consider. But the other possible version of events is even more eerie. Various news sources actually reported that Kristen hadn't heard the pop of gunfire at all. Instead, they alleged that according to CCTV footage, after shooting Victoria, Randy found Kristen where she was working, and eerily looms only a few feet behind her and the whole time she has no idea that he's there. Randy has his shotgun still hot from being fired and just watches her for five seconds. Then he turns and goes into the next aisle. I don't know which account is true, but regardless, both versions are incredibly creepy. In the other aisle, Randy finds Brian. He shoots him from far away, hitting his arm, groin, chest, and the right side of his head. Three of the five shots Brian was hit with were lethal. Randy also hunts down his oldest co-worker, who at this point had probably heard the gunshots. Terry Sterling is shot twice in the back and shoulder, and I imagine that he must have been trying to run away when he was killed. I've never seen a narrator so horny to describe the gruesome, brutal depictions of murder. It's like, I hate to say this, but dial it back a little bit, buddy. Oh my God, dude. I can... Hear his erection from here. The vibes are super fucked. According to Kristen, while this was happening, she still hadn't moved. She was frozen in fear, sure that what she had seen was a bad prank because how could it actually have been real? When she finally makes herself move, she runs to check on Victoria where she isn't moving. She even tries to shake her a little to wake her up, but though Victoria still has a heartbeat, she's in a critical condition. Kristen realizes she has to go and get help. Because she doesn't know where Randy is in the store, she calls 911 on her phone while still in the aisle. What she didn't know was that it was sadly too late for any of her co-workers to be saved. She then runs to the self-scanners in the store, and as she does, she can hear even more gunshots. At the scanner, she can't see exactly where Randy is, a very dangerous and vulnerable position to be in. So to keep track of his location, she takes a risk and runs a little further. When she spots him and his back is turned, 
Kristen makes a break for the front door. Once there, she's able to reach past the pallet that Randy has blocked the exit with and finally unlock the door. But when she goes to push it open, her heart sinks. The door won't slide. Panicking, Kristen slams her shoulder into the door until it pops open and she can run outside and into the parking lot. Even as a brief wave of relief floods over her, she knows she's not out of the woods yet. Her instincts are to run for a car, but when she sees Randy's vehicle, she decides to avoid it and keep running up a hill in order to hide behind a bush until help arrives. While Kristen is escaping, Randy is still inside finishing his plan. Though he's managed to shoot all of his co-workers except Kristen, he opens fire on some of the merchandise in the store, shattering glass all around him before he shoots at a few of the small portable propane tanks. He wants them to blow up to destroy the store and him with it, but they don't explode. Randy continues to randomly fire in the store before he dis- Wait, why didn't they blow up? They weren't filled? That's a myth? Oh, wow. I always thought that like a full propane tank could blow up if you shot it. Video game physics lol. No, not like blow up in fire, but uh, or well, I guess like it could be fire. What if you shot at it multiple times? Like if you shot into the fucking gas decides that he has met the end of his thorough plan. Just as calmly as he made his way through the store, Randy then walks into the deli section where he takes his own life. In a gruesomely short amount of time, a total of 59 bullets were fired, all from just one of the shotguns Randy carried. His last tweet was, Goodbye, humans. I'll miss you. All three of his co-workers died from their wounds. Only Kristen managed to escape. Even when talking about how she had fled the store, Two lives, motherfucker, two. Kristen still has no idea why Randy didn't shoot her, and so we may never know why he chose to spare her. But I think the fact that most of Randy's shootings were from farther away means that he was trying to distance himself from what he was doing. And after looking Kristen in the eyes, he couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. After the chaos of the attack, investigators were trying to understand Randy's motive that night. So they searched his home where they found seven boxes of 12-gauge shotgun ammunition, shooting goggles, ear protectors, and a shotgun buttstock. Police also ended up taking some of his notebooks with drawings and cartoons along with his computer as evidence. Together, these materials painted a clear picture for authorities, and digging deeper into his personal life reinforced that Randy was struggling with his gender identity and really documented his declining mental health. But the tapes he released that night, filmed over the past year planning the supermarket massacre, were the most telling especially the strange details he focused on. You see, Randy was acutely concerned that his parents would throw away his posters after what happened, something that really shows how narcissistic he was. In the middle of planning a massacre, he was worried about his posters. One thing I honestly hope that you guys do, give these posters to fans. You know, this room was something special. You know, the posters completely border the room. It looks amazing in here. Nobody's room looks quite like mine does. If you really think about it, it's very unique. Yo, this motherfucker had two likes on his goodbye humans tweet. How many fans did they have at the time? Like, wh what are we talking about? Like, I, I feel like this person was just like a delusional psychopath who thought that they were like, Elameo, how many fans do you see him? But no, but for real, like, what fans, motherfucker? You had two likes. Okay, rice gum. No, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it feeds into their delusion. Do you understand? Like, they have an inflated sense of self that comes with like hyper narcissism and that's what i'm trying to point out here i mean you'll have my phone and all that you could just post on my social media <laughs> would anyone want these you know and i autographed the back of them i autographed the back of all of them so you know they're worth something but what's most clear in his tapes is how baffled randy was that somehow no one took notice of the it's kind of wild because like i don't think they had fans bro i think like they were just delusional and, and, and thought that they did. And it's ironic because, like, I don't think anybody's like, oh, my God, I'm such a fan of Randy Stare. Uh, and I really want to buy their poster. You know what I mean? Like, no one knew. No one cares. I had no fucking clue. Like, I will forget about this tomorrow. It is irrelevant. I will never think about it ever again. I mean... Out of thousands of people, how many get more than two likes? I have 100 followers and never get likes, lol. Wait, really? I mean, I feel like if you have 100 followers, like you get one like every now and then. The warning signs, especially his parents. 
the warning signs were always there. They were there from the beginning. You could always say, what if, what if, what if, what could we have done? You know, how didn't we know it was all there in front of your face? You know, welcome to reality. In these final videos, Randy released the night of the massacre. It's abundantly clear that he's lost all touch with reality. He even says that he believes the cartoon character Ember is a goddess. I believe in a goddess, which is Ember. He went so far as to document his unapologetic anticipation while sitting in his car, talking about how his colleagues are blissfully unaware of his plans. There are hours and hours of tapes to pour over, and that's what makes this case so chilling. Something I found shocking was just how precisely Randy had planned everything that was going to happen. Not only did he know who he would be working with and made sure to have two guns so nothing would stop him, and had videos ready to upload in the hour directly preceding the shooting, Randy also took the time to send an email to the actress who voiced the cartoon character Ember in the series he had created. Less than an hour before he shot his co-workers, Randy thanked her and said that by the time she read the email, he would be dead. Clearly, he had some very strange priorities in his last moments, but what's really crazy about this email is that in it, Randy apparently claims that he had a true purpose to his videos, including the final one, the promised Westboro High Massacre. The voiceover actress didn't go into the details about what exactly Randy's true purpose for the videos were, but I'm guessing it had something to do with his belief that when he died, he would cross over to the animated world. Was that the fucking emblem editor? For Call of Duty, dude? That's it, bro. That's it. Ban video games. Nah, just ban them. Fuck it. Least murderous Call of Duty fan. Now, this may sound like the end of the story to you, but it isn't. And Randy didn't think it was the end either. Again, all of the videos that Randy uploaded just before he took his own life told his side of the story. The bio of his Twitter profile even said that he was speaking from before and beyond the grave. Watching his videos, I realized that they show a slow progression from the funny and goofy guy in his earlier videos into the monster who would show up on the night of the shooting. I actually found it really surreal to watch the Westboro High Massacre video myself. It starts with a swear-filled rant before it Yo, he sounds horny again, dude. Bro, someone needs to do a wellness check on the narrator, dude. What the fuck, dude? Okay, we like we like true crime as well, you know? We like to watch true crime, but this was his YouTube. 8,009, come on. Are you serious? Wait, what the fuck? Five months ago? Wait, what? Oh, 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 because it's, it's a time machine. Oh my fucking God, that scared the shit out of me, dude. I thought maybe someone took over their fucking channel and was like running it or something. Can you watch videos in the time machine? No, right? All this because of a ghost girl. Have you learned the Raven technique? Yeah, for real though. Zoomers have better coping mechanisms now. Honestly, it's not even a joke. Zoomers just fucking shift. If they stayed alive for like a couple more years, they could have been on TikTok learning how to shift into being like ghost mode in Danny Phantom universe. And then fucking crying about how shifting is actually really important. And it's definitely not daydreaming. And that's a very real reality. It shows Randy readying two rifles, which were the ones he used in the shooting and it even includes a few cutaway scenes that show him in the grocery store. Of course, showing the place that would later become a crime scene was disturbing, but it was made all the weirder by being followed with sections of Randy playing on a schoolyard playground. Still, what makes the whole thing even more bizarre is the overall poor quality of his legacy video and the hundreds of comments below it ridiculing him for exactly this reason. Randy even went so far to make... What is he saying? What's this motherfucker saying? Yo, it's on nice hat, dude. Love the way it fits you. Quick question though. Does it come in men's? Thanks. Wow, dude. Wow. Wow. This motherfucker wore a $5,000 jacket last night to the party and then flexed on me. Okay. If you guys watched a misgive stream and I was like calling Jake out when I was calling Jake out for uh, always wearing like expensive shit. Oh my god, look at how out of touch this rich guy is, dude. Oh no, it was just $800. Yeah, what did you say afterwards? You said, but now you can't buy this anywhere, so now it's $5,000.
I was trying to fit in feels rain man. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to hear about it. Okay, at least Jake didn't look like this Good one. Oh, I did at least Jake didn't at least Jakey Bakey didn't look like this governor Oh, it's me. I'm fucking Aiden I asked uh, Noel if he thought this was a good idea I want to I want to like connect with some fucking YouTube like car guy and I want to soup up my Camry, like, just all the way, you know what I mean? For a YouTube video. Just like matte black, you know, put like, you know, put kits on it, spoiler shit like that. Look up Donut Media there in LA. Yeah, I, I know. Go to West Coast Customs. Okay, let's finish this Part video and then we'll look at the cars. Part of this final video, a tribute to himself, with clips of him playing and sad so, music guy underneath. Is so it's interesting to consider why exactly Randy targeted the supermarket. In his journal entries, he talked about how targeting the supermarket would be lame. But for some reason, he did it anyway. As it turns out, Randy said in one of his videos that his father was a manager there, and the two weren't exactly getting along. Once I started having lousy grades and applying for jobs, and it just, I hated him. Didn't even want to look at him. And then all he seemed to care about was, like, me getting a full-time job and making money and then trying to move out of the house and start my own life and all this shit, which I knew I never I was never gonna do prime example of people I hate in this world prime example of someone who could be nice and happy and easy going and joking one day to better straighten out your life the next I thought I could be bipolar too but good lord I hate my profession I want to quit find another job that's what you tell me to do you hated your job for years what'd you do you took it out on your family way to go that's definitely the answer to all your problems, isn't it? You hear that? That's me clapping and applauding from the heavens above. When's the last time you ever said you were proud of me? When's the last time you ever said I love you? And I'll tell you one thing, back in elementary school, middle school, I used to worry about dad dying the most out of anyone in this house because I loved him back then. Once high school took off and college and all that, and I, I found it impossible to love him anymore. And I just started hating guys more than anything. Something I tracked down which gave me a new insight beyond what you might find about the Weiss Market shooting was Randy's autopsy report. In addition to the gruesome details of his death, the autopsy revealed a couple of really interesting things. And as I go through what I found, the details will only get more intriguing. There's no blood, right? <clears throat> Reading the autopsy report, I found out that Randy was wearing black makeup at the time of his death. The report says that it was on his lips and in orbit patterns, which made me think that he had drawn his makeup to look like the swirls that Ember from Danny Phantom wears around her eyes. When his body was found, he apparently had women's clothing on under- I'm losing my mind, dude. The narrator is like actually horny. It's so weird. <sighs> Wanted to look like Ember. <sighs> Neath his regular clothing. And here's the most interesting find. Randy had 372 milliliters of diphenhydramine in his system when he died. For those of you who don't know, diphenhydramine is Benadryl, and you should never take more than the recommended amount as it can be fatal. But Randy had ingested way over the maximum that anyone should ever take. As soon as I saw this, I realized something. Randy would have been essentially suffering from an overdose that night. His vision would have been blurred. He could have felt really confused, unsteady, or drowsy. And most startlingly, he could have been suffering from seizures and hallucinations as well. I can only speculate about why Randy may have chosen to take this much of something that would harm him, but I think it's interesting to consider that he could have been seeing or hearing things that night. Of course, he had been planning this attack for a long time, and any hallucinations may not have affected what he did. But another really interesting element of this whole thing is Randy's own comments about drugs. In his own tapes, he talks about how he isn't interested in drugs. So, why did he take a harmful amount of Benadryl that night? Was it to ensure that he didn't back out of his plan? Some people have speculated that he may have been hallucinating the animated character Ember. In a 2018 interview, Kristen came forward to speak on her experience, and she emphasized that Randy was suffering from a mental illness, and that the man who carried out these evil acts wasn't the person she and her co-workers knew and loved. This was someone different. After speaking with other employees, she says everyone agreed on one thing. They never saw this coming. And maybe that's the scariest part about this whole story. Whether it was a slow, inevitable buildup or a sudden snap, nobody could see the hidden demons just below the surface of Randy's quiet and unassuming demeanor until it was much too late. 
Although nothing can reverse this awful tragedy, perhaps it can serve as a lesson of the kinds of warning signs that may be able to alert us that someone is a danger to themselves and potentially everyone around them too.